welcome to today's panel on public access and anonymity. Uh, this event is the final in our privacy and access series. My name is Michael Karnikolis, and I'm the executive director of the UCLA Institute for Technology, Law and Policy, which is co-organizing this series along with the Ziffrin Institute for Media, Entertainment, Technology and Sports Law. We have an excellent panel to discuss today's topic. Uh, Thomas Kadri is an assistant professor of law at the University of Georgia School of Law. Amy Gajda is uh, the class of 1937 professor of law at Tulane Law School. And Eugene Volok is the Gary T. Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA. And our moderator for this session is uh, Mark Verstreet, uh, resident fellow here at UCLA ITLP. We are planning to set aside some time for Q&A and audience engagement at the end. So feel, uh, feel free to plug your questions or comments into the chat at any time. Um, Mark, I pass things over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. And uh, I just want to kind of reiterate what Michael said. As the audience, feel free to participate and enter questions into the chat function. But today, broadly, we're talking about the relationship between transparency and privacy, uh, the transformation from analog records to digital records requests has changed the nature of how people can access information. And these increases in transparency have sort of at the same time uh, reshaped how we think about privacy of the people whose records are being requested. So. Um, our panelists will broadly talk about this topic and we'll hear about some sort of areas within the law where this is playing out. So I'm going to kick it to Thomas for a, a set of opening remarks and then uh, we'll move to Eugene and then Amy. So Thomas, why don't you go ahead? Great. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, so um, uh, I think I'm, I'm going to just start by trying to um, lay a bit of the, the, the background and the groundwork of at least what I think about when I um, encounter questions of kind of access and anonymity and transparency as it relates to digital technologies and, and especially the internet. Um, and for me, at least, I kind of, I, I often go back to work by the likes of Dana Boyd and Marianne Franks, who, you know, were writing um, uh, not that long ago, but in, in internet years, it seems like quite a long time ago, kind of thinking about the ways in which network technologies um, kind of shift uh, information flows um, and, and kind of can, can change the way in which people interact, you know, by and through network technologies. Um, and, and a couple of things that I know that, you know, they, that their work highlighted um, uh, is how, you know, the internet in particular um, uh, kind of creates permanence where maybe there wasn't so much permanence. It creates kind of searchability, um, uh, uh, ease of kind of finding information um, that you know is not brand new, but it certainly kind of changed the way uh, that information can flow. Um, and a lot of those kind of issues of kind of searchability and, 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 and permanence um, uh, can, can bring a lot of good things, right? Can bring a lot of great uh, transparency gains, um, can bring uh, a lot of interest in, in terms of you know communications that were in, you know that are now enabled um, uh, that weren't so easily done before. Uh, but it can also right bring about some uh, uh, harms. Uh, that maybe, you know, were once there, but the re reduction in, in friction in certain ways and, and certain other affordances that, that the internet gives us um, can really exacerbate, you know, certain harms. And so in, in uh, my work, a project that I'm working on right now, um, I think of as kind of like part of that, uh, uh, you know, tied into some of those broader questions, right? Um, uh, thinking about the way in which data brokers um, and particularly kind of the people search sites that they run, um, which, you know, some of you, I'm sure if you've ever Googled your name and, and tried to, you know, see what comes up, um, uh, often you'll be shocked at the amount of information that kind of comes up about you. Um, and, and often it's in the form of these kind of people search sites where your name, address, and maybe even your um, uh, phone number and family members and uh, close associations and former employers and uh, all of that kind of information can, can, can sometimes be gleaned, sometimes for free, sometimes once you register an account, sometimes if you pay an amount, right? Um, and so these uh, uh, these sites in particular, um, they pose all sorts of, I think, interesting complications in terms of access and transparency and, and anonymity. Um, uh, but one feature that I'm looking at in particular is how these sites uh, can kind of facilitate stalking and harassment and other forms of interpersonal uh, abuse. Um, and, uh, and, and there have been various ways, right, that uh, over time, uh, different forms of legal regulation have tried to kind of intercede on this particular issue of kind of identifying information being um, uh, maybe easier 
uh, and, and, and cheaper to find and gather than, than ever before. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't want to go into too much depth about, about my particular project, but that, you know, there are all sorts of kind of interesting ways in which the law and not just law, but um, kind of market actors uh, and, and the technology itself could be used to kind of regulate these types of information flows. Um, uh, but, but as things stand right now, even though there are increasing recognitions of kind of legal rights to opt out of data brokers kind of having your information or to conceal it in certain ways, uh, it is still um, uh, at the very least a very inefficient process. Uh, where if you've ever tried to do this, you'll see that you need to kind of go to each and every broker website and try and opt out individually. And it's not always clear that they'll respond to your requests or honor your requests. Um, and, and even if they do, then they'll, they may replenish their kind of data stocks at a certain point, and then you end up back on the website again. And so it's this very disaggregated process. And so I've been kind of trying to do some, um, some work, some thinking about uh, first, the nature of that harm uh, for people who are trying to regain some obscurity um, that these websites kind of deny them, uh, how that actually is likely to affect people, particularly um, survivors of, of, of interpersonal abuse who are trying to, to, to get out of these kind of um, sites. Um, and then on top of kind of building out that picture of the harm, how regulation might actually adequately respond to that kind of harm um, in a way that I, I think current kind of legal and technical and market-based regimes sort of fail um, to do. So that's a little bit about kind of what I've been thinking about um, recently in this space. Perfect. Thank you, Thomas, for teeing up some of the uh, core tensions that are at play here. And now we'll move to Eugene. Yes, thanks very much for, uh, for uh, uh, having me uh, uh, on this panel. This is a subject that I think is tremendously important. I don't fully know what the right answer is on this. I guess there are lots of things in which I don't fully know the right answer. This is one of them. Uh, and I, I've been particularly focused on this in the context of pseudonymity in litigation. Basically lawsuits brought by people who are, who are John Doe's. Uh, who, who want to be John Doe's. Um, and uh, uh, the connection here to the internet is, of course, it used to be that if you're involved in a lawsuit, maybe it'll get covered in a local newspaper, in which case some people will read about it, but then they'll mostly forget. Maybe it won't even be covered by, uh, uh, in the uh, newspaper. So if somebody really, really wants to track things down, it could go and search musty court files. And there's all this information about what you accuse people of doing or what you were accused of doing, uh, but rarely accessible. Now, uh, for very good reasons, a lot of uh, uh, companies, private companies, nonprofits, and sometimes government entities themselves, uh, place all sorts of court records, certainly court opinions, but also just dockets, uh, uh, filings and the like, uh, place them on the internet. So if I get sued or if I sue, if somebody searches my name, then they will very quickly find that litigation. Maybe not mine, because I have a wide Google footprint, but for most people, especially ones, by the way, with unusual names, you know, John Smith's, there's safety in numbers. Eugene Volokh, there's safety in all the various other posts that I've written and such. But for most people, one of the things that will come up very quickly is uh, uh, any court filings. So what does our legal system say about pseudonymity? Well, the general rule is that pseudonymity is... Uh, uh, is not um, uh, not the norm. In fact, it's very much the exception. Uh, I'm not sure. Does did the share? Am I sharing the screen? No. Maybe this. Does, can you see my slide? Yes. So let's look at it as an example and something stemming out of an alleged sexual assault. And I use sexual assault advisedly because it could be rape. It could be some lesser sexual assault. Sometimes even sexual harassment. Uh, but a wide range of these kinds of things. Um, so let's say that Arnold is accused of sexually assaulting his classmate Veronica. If there's a criminal case, it's very well established that Arnold cannot be a dope. It's going to be people v. Arnold. Is that potentially unfair to Arnold? Absolutely, because after all, maybe he's innocent. For, he's presumed innocent, right? So we presume him innocent, but we air all of these allegations, assuming, of course, a grand jury uh, in those places that have a grand jury or a prosecutor in those places that don't do the sign off on probable cause, but we air these allegations. Maybe eventually he'll be acquitted, but the reputational damage may well be done. Uh, 
And when people Google his name, they'll see the allegations. Maybe they won't see the, the acquittal right there. So despite that, we do not have pseudonymous litigation. And the, the reason is the courts say uh, the public is entitled to supervise the judicial system, is entitled not just to trust that the judicial system is operating correctly, but to be able to monitor it, to watch what's actually happening. Uh, usually that's of course done through the media, but, but it could be through researchers or it could be just through individual, uh, individual searching. And that's why we don't have generally speaking closed criminal cases or closed civil cases. And courts say the same thing applies to closing even just the name of the crime. Let's say Veronica sues Arnold for sexual assault as a battery tort or some such. Generally speaking, that will often be Veronica versus Arnold. There's a lot of cases that are like that. Though sometimes we allow Veronica to sue because she's alleging that she was sexually assaulted. That's seen as a very private, intimate matter. And that we say, well, she should be entitled to, to sue pseudonymously. So sometimes it's Doe v. Arnold. Very rarely is it Doe v. Roe. Even though I suppose Arnold could say, well, you know, whatever the harm to her privacy might be from having to be identified as a sexual assault victim, or at least claiming to be a sexual assault victim, surely there's even greater harm to my privacy slash reputation from having to be identified as an alleged perpetrator before there's any finding that I am. Maybe again, I expect to be exonerated at trial, but by then the damage would have been done. And occasionally you do actually see courts allowing Doe v. Roe claims like this. Although quite rarely, one piece of evidence is you rarely hear about a case called Doe v. Roe. What if it's a libel case? What if Arnold sues Veronica for libel? Often that's just Arnold v. Veronica, maybe Arnold v. Roe. Although Arnold may very well say in order to really vindicate my rights, I have to be able to sue pseudonymously. Uh, as Doe v. Uh, somebody, there was, for example, an attempt at doing that, which actually I stepped in to try to oppose on behalf of Electronic Frontier Foundation and First Amendment Coalition, and then it was dismissed on other grounds. Doe v. Billington, somebody was suing some, a woman who had uh, accused him uh, of uh, sexually assaulting her. And, um, uh, and he said, look, in order to I mean, if you require me to sue under my own name, then that's going to basically render pointless any remedy I might have because the very the, the very lawsuit would, through the Streisand effect, further amplify the original allegations against me. Uh, so again, I totally understand why plaintiff might want to do that. But again, if you want to be able to monitor what's going on in the legal system, well, then presumably uh, knowing who it is who's making these allegations will be pretty important to that. So occasionally you see Doe v. Roe cases and such libel cases very, very early. Interestingly, there is one right now in New York was actually even a gag order on a defendant uh, prohibiting her on pain of contempt of court from, from identifying the person who's suing her for because she had accused him uh, of sexual assault. However, interestingly, if there are lawsuits over allegedly biased Title IX investigations of the very same sexual assault, Routinely, in over in over eighty percent of all the cases that I've seen that have considered the issue, people uh, the the uh, plaintiffs are allowed to sue as Doe v. USC. Uh, USC is just an example. Could be UCLA. There have been Doe v. UC, Doe v. MIT. I just filed an amicus brief in that case discussing this very issue. An interesting question is why, right? It's not exactly a libel claim, but it's or, or uh, but it's kind of like that. The claim is. I was wrongly accused, and then it's not so much that somebody said bad things about me as such, it's that I was expelled incorrectly. Uh, so it's a, a very hard, the whole point of my amicus brief is to say it's very hard to distinguish the two. Uh, so I just want to close on that. Now we can talk later on about whether this makes sense, maybe it does make sense, or maybe the answer should be less in uh, as pseudonymity, maybe the answer should be more pseudonymity. But I just wanted to lay out the way in which the ways in which these issues come up and the, what seems to me an inconsistent way the legal system treats like it. Great. Thank you so much, Eugene. Um, over to you, Amy. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me to be a part of this. Uh, what I want to do is talk just a little bit about um, a current project uh, that's out um, and then a couple of projects that I'm working on uh, that touch on these um, matters. Uh, so I had um, a book published uh, last week called Seek and Hide. Uh, and as a part of that book, what I did is I, um, I had uh, a background check done on me 
uh, and that touches a little bit on um, what Thomas has talked about here and the really remarkable bits of information that, um, that are compiled uh, about people like me, including my addresses, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I don't have a very interesting background, uh, but as it turns out, some of my neighbors do. Uh, and so as a part of my $150 background check, uh, their criminal um, histories uh, came up, um, their, uh, their um, uh, past uh, lawsuits, uh, as Eugene um, suggested uh, as well. Uh, so there's an awful lot of information that comes up uh, in um, uh, just in a simple background check for $150. Uh, through um, the, the California law that allows individuals to request information from data brokers, um, I also um, asked um, various um, data compilers um, uh, who I was uh, and, um, and got information from uh, Experian, got information from, um, from Amazon. Amazon knows that I own a bulldog, for example, and I assume that's uh, through my interactions um, on um, the internet uh, somehow. Uh, Experian um, knows me as a Lux women's, uh, um, a Lux women's uh, um, uh, clothing shopper, uh, uh, among other things. So there's a lot of data um, out there um, uh, about us. Uh, some of it, of course, um, from, um, from public uh, records. Um, what I'm working on now uh, are two projects um, that, that touch on this uh, a little bit. Uh, one is about, um, one is a, a new book um, proposal that I'm working on about um, a, a child's right to privacy. Um, and, and there it's been uh, very interesting to take a look at um, medical ethics and journalism ethics regarding uh, a child's medical privacy. How much can uh, a parent, for example, reveal? How much should a parent reveal um, online about a child's medical condition? And should, in fact, that um, condition then, or should that child be able to sue uh, later on for the revelation um, of, uh, of that information. And what I think is, is interesting um, uh, with regard to what we're talking about here um, um, uh, when considering that project is that uh, what I've been able to do is go through um, death certificates and uh, find out um, from public records then uh, what really happened to people and how people really died. And, uh, and there's a lot of private information in there, a lot of family secrets that are now available online uh, through, um, through these, um, these death certificates. Uh, so that's, that's a book project that I'm working on. Um, I'm also working on a chapter uh, on, um, on mugshots and criminal histories and the right to be forgotten. And, uh, and what's interesting now is that, um, is that courts um, uh, at least are beginning, let's say, very, very early on, beginning to recognize um, perhaps a, a right to privacy in old criminal histories, even though that information was, in fact, um, public record uh, once. Uh, so they're suggesting that um, that information that's 10 years old, for example, um, should be removed from a website because um, because it's old and it's no longer newsworthy and we don't need to know uh, that information. Uh, as a parallel uh, with that, um, in, uh, so I'm a former journalist, I do a lot on, um, on media and privacy. Uh, and, uh, and so what's very interesting for me as a journalist is uh, that a lot of news organizations are doing the same thing. So, um, so journalism has decided uh, in ethics terms uh, not to um, publish mugshots anymore, um, not to reveal uh, as much as they, um, they have before about an individual's um, criminal history. So I think um, both of those things that we at least traditionally thought of as being um, public records um, are being cloaked um, with privacy um, in law uh, and then also in journalism. So those are the things that, that I'm working on now. Fantastic. Thank you so much for the opening remarks. You all have incredible projects. Um, sort of one thing I was hearing is, uh, Thomas, you mentioned it, Eugene, you mentioned it, is this loss of obscurity. So traditionally, in order to find a public record about someone, you may have to actually go to a courthouse and look through um, files um, with the internet that sort of changes. Um, at the same time, uh, many areas of law see this sort of dichotomy between uh, a right to privacy and public information. So Traditionally, when information is public, um, a person has a limited or even no right to privacy over that information. Um, but as Amy mentioned, sort of we're seeing maybe a bit of changes in, in norms, particularly in journalism saying, uh, 
hey, even if this information is public, um, there's actually a privacy interest that might be at play. And so we're balancing that privacy interest against things like newsworthiness in terms of, of uh, publishing mugshots or stories detailing um, specific information about a person. So sort of what I wanna ask is, um, are our existing institutions either sort of legal, um, the set of norms that, you, that we use to govern information, um, how are they sort of put under pressure by this change of easy access to information and how might they respond? And um, maybe sort of to Amy's point, like how could we foster um, changes in norms across different branches of industries? And maybe even at a, a higher level of generality, uh, to what extent is that warranted or even necessary? So um, whoever wants to respond first, go ahead and then we'll let you all sort of respond organically. I'm happy to, to, to jump in um, uh, on that question. I mean, so I think, I mean, Mark, you, you, you said it more eloquently than I, I could, um, uh, but certainly this is a, a pressure point that is coming up in all sorts of areas of the law, um, uh, above and beyond the, the many areas that even the three of us just kind of uh, touched on in our opening remarks. I mean, I certainly think about the way in which uh, Fourth Amendment jurisprudence is being uh, kind of tested by uh, the ways in which technology allows for either prolonged surveillance or surveillance in public um, in a way that implicates these kind of older conceptions uh, or more traditional conceptions, let's just say, of kind of private public distinctions um, and expectations of privacy. And, and, and um, you know, when I think about uh, something like a lot of my my work in this area, I I I, I try and draw heavily on on um, uh, work by Woody Hartzog, who, who talks about the you know the the value of obscurity, right? How privacy as a value can serve um, uh, uh, interests in obscurity, which is very different from interests in secrecy or interests in anonymity. Well, not very different; they're, they're they're interrelated somewhat. But but the idea of trying to make information either harder to understand or harder to find has value beyond just trying to uh, delete information or conceal it entirely, right? Um, and so uh, whether that's in, in the context of kind of like facial recognition technology, um, where all of a sudden, right, yeah, sure, you're out in public, um, but do you have an interest, a privacy interest uh, in, in having some of your movements in public not be quite so easily to find or to understand and to kind of connect them together with other bits of information. Um, similarly, when it comes to, uh, you know, my project on, on, on data brokers, a lot of the information that people search sites are um, uh, sharing right, is from public records. Um, so does that then mean that somebody has absolutely no privacy interest in uh, that information not being so readily accessible? I think traditional understandings of privacy might have said, yeah, that, I mean, that, that pretty much settles it. It's in a public record. Um, uh, but if, you, if you're focusing on, a, on an obscurity interest rather than a, a pure secrecy interest, um, uh, as I think we kind of should in certain, in certain instances when we're thinking about privacy, uh, then, you know, that, that, that kind of distinction, uh, uh, you know, isn't dispositive, right? Is it in a public record? Sure it is, uh, but maybe there's still an interest in having certain information from uh, certain public records more obscure. Um, uh, and, and the language that we use here really, right, really matters. Um, and so I know, you know, Amy touched on the right to be forgotten. Um, this is like a classic kind of misnomer in terms of what the right actually, actually did. It wasn't a right to kind of forget history. Uh, it was a de-indexing uh, interest, right? Um, uh, but, but, you know, how we, how we conceive that is, is shaped by the norms to kind of get to your, your, your point, Mark. So if we're thinking about this as a, uh, a right to be forgotten or a right to delete history, um, uh, then I think it's, you know, very unlikely that the law is going to recognize such a broad conception of a right. If we think about it as interests in, in you know, some form of limited obscurity or as Eugene's talking about pseudonymity in certain circumstances, um, then in my view, we might have more productive conversations. So I, I have a blog, and on the blog, I often blog about court cases, and often I just excerpt them. Uh, sometimes I open on them, uh, I opine on them, but sometimes I just excerpt them, because I think uh, our, our readers find it interesting to see cases, uh, usually not the ones that are in the front page of some other newspaper, although sometimes there are, but look to see what the court actually says, and I think I add some value by identifying what the key points are. 
And then periodically I get emails from people uh, saying various degrees of threateningness uh, and various degrees of politeness, well, usually fairly politely, uh, uh, please uh, remove this post or de-index this post. And often it is, you talked about either a lawsuit against me or persecution of me or a lawsuit by me. Pretty often, I mean, just happened a couple of days ago. Uh, somebody, uh, somebody emailed said, my client uh, sued his employer and then there was a court case. It turns out there also was a lot of media coverage in that instance. Um, uh, Reuters, for example, covered it. And uh, now he's finding it hard to get a job. And we think it's because of this coverage. So please remove this. And I didn't, partly because my general rule is not to. I think it's important that people be able to see this. And likewise with indexing, like sometimes they may want to look things up by the name of the case. One of the things is that the Case name is the official title for the, for the case. You could imagine a court system that does things otherwise, that even if the name isn't fully pseudonymous, you can find it in the record, at least it isn't right there as the official name of the case. Uh, but in our system it is. Uh, plus also in that particular case, what had happened was that this original lawyer, when the lawsuit was filed, he sent out a press release about this, presumably to get a better settlement. That makes it, that makes it uh, a tougher sell uh, to say, well, now, now please de-index it. Although if I'm candid, I'd have to say that even if that hadn't been so, I would have still said no. Maybe I was wrong though, but here's my tentative thinking. So the, the plaintiff in that case says, you know, I, I'm being harmed because, because what? Because people are learning about this lawsuit and are maybe unfairly retaliating against me. They're saying uh, he is a litigious employee. We, I don't, we don't want to hire him. That's not fair. But I take it to the extent he's right, and maybe there are other reasons he isn't being hired, to the extent he's right, take it, some of the employers may say, well, we think it's actually quite fair, right? We search for his name, we look it up, and maybe we don't want litigious employees, or maybe it's not so much that he was litigious as we actually see the nature of the litigation and we think he was in the wrong there, maybe, hard to tell. So the real question is, not just whether people are interested in protecting their privacy in this respect, in the sense of making sure that people don't, or making it harder for people to learn certain things about them. The real question is why we should prefer those people's interests over the interests of other people can learn. And those can come up in a lot of situations. I've been married for 20 years and come, come August, uh, hope to get, be married the rest of my life. But once upon a time, I was dating. And, you know, sometimes when you're thinking about going out with someone, you'd like to see what can I learn about them. You know, you probably don't want to make it super public. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, some, you might want to do that. And you might think it's a, it's a matter of protecting your heart and maybe protecting your body, right? What if it turns out that this person was accused of rape, let's say? A woman is considering dating a man and uh, she, she Googles it and, you know, Maybe it's fair, maybe it's not a fair accusation, but she might think, you know, I, I should be entitled to, to figure out if these accusations have been made and then see what weight to give them. Um, uh, or what if you are considering either an employee, by the way, there are some legal restraints on employers refusing to hire employees because of their past discrimination claims, because that might be seen as impermissible retaliation. But, there, but they only apply to certain kinds of claims. What if it's a prospective business partner. I'm trying to see if I should enter into a deal with this person. And it turns out there's been these lawsuits and, you know, I'm not sure I should entrust my money to this person. Why shouldn't my interest be seen as at least as legitimate as his interests in denying me and others like me easy access to this information? And, I, I, and, it's, it's, and you know, maybe the answer is that there is some reason to privilege the private interest. Well, there, you could imagine, for example, you may say it's so important that people have an incentive to bring legitimate lawsuits. That we're, and we're so afraid that publicizing those lawsuits will basically make it much less likely the law will be enforced. That for the, in the interest of enforcing the law, we should try to hold the wool over the eyes of future prospective business partners, lovers, various, various others. Maybe, uh, but it just seems to me not an open and shut question like, aren't we for more privacy? Well, I don't know if we're for more privacy in this kind of situation or we should be. Fantastic, Amy, do you have thoughts on some of this? Sure, just a, a couple of things like Eugene, uh, um, so journalism today is, uh, is uh, 
journalists are getting these same sort of requests and they are taking down information, which I think is really fascinating. So, uh, so uh, unlike it sounds like Eugene um, routinely, uh, journalists will be responsive. Um, primarily this is um, with regard to criminal histories, uh, but then some uh, newsrooms have moved to um, uh, stop publishing uh, information after a certain date. So for example, you know, after three years that those um, news stories will no longer be available online. Uh, and, um, and so, so again, sort of thinking about these, um, these norms and how norms affect law, um, uh, I, I predict that, uh, that that will in fact have an effect on the way the law um, uh, looks at things. Um, uh, I also um, uh, uh, want to suggest that the more we learn about the information that's out there, so the more individuals better understand the data that's out there, the more individuals better understand um, the stuff data brokers are getting from this, um, this public information, uh, I think the greater the push then um, from the public uh, about, about changing um, the sorts of norms uh, that we have um, going on right now, or at least we had you know, a year or two ago. Fantastic, so a, a few things I'm hearing. So. Um, I think we all have sort of agreed and have a bit of consensus that there's sort of like this public interest at play in terms of access to information, and then an interest that we think is more private or individual, which would be this right to privacy, or as Thomas mentioned, maybe it's not privacy, maybe it's obscurity, which is subtly different. Um, are there any ways that we can think about in terms of like how we can balance these interests or sort of uh, find a compromise or maybe um, you have thoughts that these are really irreconcilable and then what do we do in that situation? And then I sort of have a broader question about what sorts of legal frameworks might we employ? So the first would be this idea about um, having a judge re require de-indexing, um, which has been the information is no longer accessible. But um, the second idea is sort of what Eugene mentioned that maybe this information is accessible, but we passed a law that says, hey, employers, you can't use this information to make hiring decisions. So um, would some of these regimes be preferable against each other? And how do we think about this uh, public versus private interest at play? I don't think there's any way to know if an employer has used that information or not. I mean, certainly if I were one of those employers, I would make sure that, um, that there was another reason for not hiring the person uh, as opposed to that. So I think that that would be um, a very a very difficult um, thing to to put um, put into play. Uh, what I think is is probably maybe well I was going to say maybe the Communications Decency Act Section two thirty plays a role here, um, but um, but you know probably not because the sorts of websites that we're talking about at least with regard to um, the public information are mostly government. Um, websites. And so, so um, just in saying that, I remember uh, within the past year or so, uh, there, there was a, a court that ordered a government database of someone's, of, of criminal um, histories removed on privacy grounds. Uh, and so, um, and so you have those sorts of cases at least suggesting that those sorts of websites, even websites created by governments for public access so that people could find out about crim past criminal histories uh, or current prisoners, for example, um, uh, government um, uh, courts have suggested that governments um, should remove uh, those things. So that's that's happening too. So I, I actually am trying to work on an article I have been uh, for a couple of years now, which I generally called Forgetting in the American Court. And uh, uh, it's interesting what happens sometimes in court. One thing that is actually pretty familiar is there are expungement statutes through which somebody, either after an acquittal or sometime after a conviction, can get his record expunged. And that's very much what the kind of thing that Amy is describing. That's an order to courts and to police agencies, order to other government officials to basically conceal that information. It's an interesting question to what extent that's constitutional given not the right to free speech, but the right First Amendment right of access to court records, because that is a matter of sealing court records. But at least some courts have said that that's, that's justifiable. Um, I'll give you another example. Uh, 
I've, uh, 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 I recall uh, seeing this, uh, this letter that was written to the Michigan Court of Appeals by somebody who says, some years ago, I was convicted of drunk driving. It was a perfectly legit conviction. It was several years ago, though. And now I see it's on your website that the Michigan Court of Appeals unpublished non-presidential decision is on your website. And I think it's making it harder for me to get a job. And I realize I have, you have no obligation to do this, but could you see your way clear to just removing it from your website or otherwise de-indexing on your website? And the court said, sure. And some of the times the court say, no. And there's no real clear rhyme or reason. Uh, probably depends partly on how sympathetic the, the applicant looks, but also probably partly on the views of the judges about the privacy and publicity, et cetera. So I appreciate that. And there's no First Amendment, certainly no First Amendment problem with a web court just saying, you know, we don't, we never had to put online our uh, unpublished decisions. It used to be there wasn't no online, so we didn't have to do that. We didn't have to publish them in print there unpublished non-presidential decisions. So, you know, in this case, we could remove it, unless it's a state statute mandating that we place all these things online. However, unsurprisingly, many private companies, both for-profit and non-profit, take a lot of these records and harvest them. So one example is Google Scholar, which takes published opinions uh, and some unpublished opinions, uh, and puts them online. Interestingly, Google search doesn't automatically search Google Scholar. You have to know to go to Google Scholar. There are other companies like Legal, and I want to say, I think Find Law Still and various others uh, that do place these online. And I think they just have a, they have a um, uh, advertising model. They say, okay, fine, we're going to sell advertising space. And the way we draw readers is all these opinions are now available online at Google search. I, I don't think a court could order them to remove this kind of thing. They're, they have their own First Amendment rights now. And then, of course, there are places like Court Listener. Court Listener is a very important nonprofit entity that, uh, uh, that uh, archives uh, PACER records, federal court records, and makes them available for free in many situations. Um, and, uh, uh, and you can go on to, pay, uh, to Court Listener and search for things. Uh, so then they clearly have First Amendment rights to do what they're doing. So, uh, so I think that while courts constraining court records may be useful, uh, it's only going to get you. It's not going to get you very far. One thing it might get you, as I understand it, is a lot of employers aren't actually really super interested in googling people, especially since yeah, if there are laws limiting use of certain information, a large employer might find it very hard to to try to skirt those laws because too many people would know about. So they just need to have procedures. And one of the procedures is background searches. In fact, they may be required by law or pressured by the threat of lawsuits for negligent hiring to do background searches. And the background searches don't do Google. It doesn't make sense for them to do it. They only search the government records. So if it's removed from government records, then it actually will do for the criminal defendant, let's say some years after the conviction, will do a lot of what they're looking for. So, so there are some things in the middle. But I do think it's important to recognize that a lot of these government records, unsurprisingly, are now in private hands. And what the government can do to hide its own records ends up being often somewhat beside the point once the records had been released, because at this point, they've now been scraped and made available, often in ways that are very useful to the public as in general. So can I, I just want to jump in here very quickly as having just had my background uh, search done. And, uh, and, and there, there was information that had been scraped on the internet, including images of me, uh, and also including uh, images of the inside of my house uh, mm -hmm. when it was put on um, the market, uh, images from ap apartments where I'd lived, um, precisely yeah. the layout of the apartment um, and, and that sort of thing. So in addition to just plain old um, government documents, there's also information like that, at but, least it was a part of mine. yeah. Yeah, and, and perhaps I'll, I'll build on, on, on both of those points, um, uh, which is to say that, you know, I mean, Mark, your initial question was, how might we go about swearing? Sorry, my dog has, has opinions about this as well. Um, shush. Uh, like, how, how do we go about swearing those interests in transparency and access, right? And or tr transparency and access on the one hand, and then maybe like privacy and obscurity on the other. Uh, and I, I would just say that, you know, I, I don't think there's going to be a one answer, obviously, um, for, uh, that cuts across all contexts. But one interesting thing 
is that um, very often the lines that we're currently drawing have not been the result of any sort of thoughtful process or democratic deliberation. In fact, it's often a story uh, that, that is totally the opposite, right? And so, for example, in the public records context, there are some public records that are, and some information that is collected and put in public records that is um, thoughtfully put in there and published for good reason. But a lot of it now is just kind of like formulaic, like, yeah, oh, this is just going to a government entity. And then the government entity has a practice of always kind of publishing things. Um, and there hasn't been as much thought about whether there needs to be quite so much information collected and whether quite so much of the information that gets collected about people also needs to be published because as both Eugene and Amy kind of commented on, once, you've, once the gene is out of the bottle as a constitutional matter and as just a practical matter, it can be very difficult to put it back in. So being more thoughtful about that is, is I think important, right? Um, similarly though, uh, you know, there, there's very little restrictions on what um, a private company, you know, on, on private companies selling and just trading and giving away information that they've collected. Right, and that has allowed this kind of vast troves of information to be um, to be gathered and collected by uh, uh, by data brokers and other companies. Right, not as the result of any sort of reasoned, thoughtful deliberation about where the line should be, but just because there's been a you know a generally speaking a real lack of, of regulation there. Um, and then you have laws, right, like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, which I've written about, um, and and how that interacts with this entire kind of process and industry where it effectively defers and historically at least has deferred to private uh, companies that run the websites to set the rules of kind of information access and trading and scraping and, and you know who's allowed to collect this information um, uh, to, to the companies themselves rather than setting different rules for like who is allowed to you know collect certain information from websites and what they're allowed to do with it right um, now I don't think that there are as I said like easy lines that, that kind of can be drawn um, uh, that's going to cut across all industries um, but but I do think that we certainly can be a little bit more uh, you know we, we, we can be more thoughtful about it and, and at least some of the rules can and should be the product of democratic deliberation rather than uh, what has currently been the case. That's fantastic. Uh, Eugene or Amy, do you have thoughts on how we can sort of recalibrate these rules? Well, I do think we want to think a little bit about the particular rules and why we should recalibrate them and if we should recalibrate them and if there are constitutional constraints uh, on, on recalibrating them. Um, so, you know, uh, Amy has written extensively about this and there is a, and the law is quite complicated, but a short version of it was that for a while, at least in some courts, the disclosure of private facts tort allowed uh, liability for publishing information about supposedly long past criminal convictions. And there was a famous case, uh, Briscoe v. Reader's Digest uh, from the early 1970s in California, where there was a conviction, very, very serious crime for, uh, for an armed robbery that turned into a gunfight with police. Uh, and then some years, I want to say not a lot, like eight or nine years afterwards, Reader's Digest published a story kind of uh, about this past incident. And the person was allowed to, to, to sue uh, on the grounds that, well, you know, right thinking people should forgive and forget. Well, usually the First Amendment doesn't allow speech restrictions on the grounds that this speak that we judges are right thinking people and we know what people what information people should have and information and certain information people shouldn't have because only wrong thinking people care about it. maybe some people would have wanted to know whether I think it's Marvin Briscoe is his name whether he had been involved in a gunfight with the police uh, and he said well you know my daughter my young daughter and my friends have abandoned me because they've learned this well maybe they in part abandoned you because they thought you you were kind of not entirely candid in telling in 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 telling your life story. So as a result, uh, after several more recent cases from the Supreme Court, not exactly on this point, but on related points, the California Supreme Court, which decided Briscoe unanimously re rejected in a case I want to say called Gates v. Superior Court from around 2004. Uh, and it said, look, you know, we're not going to leave it to judges and juries to decide when information from the public record is so old uh, that it becomes illegal, whether criminally punishable or civilly, uh, uh, leading to civil liability to, to publish it. So I think that there, it's right that there be some First Amendment constraints, in fact, pretty broad First Amendment constraints uh, uh, constraints here. 
this having been said, I do think there are interesting questions. Like, for example, what about pseudonymity? Maybe we should have a system which is mostly pseudonymous in litigation. Apparently, Germany and Austria have that. On the other hand, you know, if, if a reporter is covering a case, and if we do take seriously the notion that the public ought to be supervising what the courts are doing, presumably usually by means of taking advantage of media coverage, if a reporter sees a Doe v. Roe case, you know, the reporter can write, here's a complaint, and here's what we got from the lawyers, which is a form denial or a no comment. But you know, you'd think that's not a great article. You'd think that a really thoughtful reporter, if the parties were named, would search around for, you know, was the, had the plaintiff made similar accusations before? Had the defendant been accused of similar things before? Is there some reason that the plaintiff might be seen as highly untrustworthy or same with defendant? Is there some reason, is there some deeper ideological acts that the person might have to grind? In some of these pseudonymous cases, it turns out the plaintiff is a vexatious litigant who's filed lots and lots of frivolous cases. Uh, or alternatively, if you know the person, I'm, I'm involved right now with a case where it's a police officer in a small town in New Hampshire was put on one of these lists by, prosec by prosecutors saying, you know, this is, we have to disclose to defense lawyers that this, that this police officer had serious accusations against him. This scotched his police career. Now he's suing as a doe. But, you know, again, if a reporter was really thoughtfully covering this article, presumably that call up people at this police department and say, hey, tell me, you know, does this guy have a real case? Or, or is he really somebody who should be on these kinds of lists? Maybe he'd call up defense lawyers in some cases where he figures out this person has testified. So, so there, re there are real costs to extra pseudonymity here as well as benefits. I do think we should be talking about this, especially when we're not talking about speech restrictions on uh, non-governmental entities. Uh, maybe there should be more pseudonymity. And again, there, there are areas where we do allow some degree of pseudonymity. Classic example is where a plaintiff is a minor. Uh, but uh, uh, but I, 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 while I certainly see the, the problems with this extra publicity and loss of privacy uh, to individuals, I also see the problems from trying to roll things back to where we had a lot less information. We as journalists, we as uh, uh, academics, we as activists, we as citizens had a lot less information about people and, and uh, that, that we were dealing with or we were writing about and the like. Yeah, I would agree. It's been very interesting for me, of course, to like find out how people really died and to struggle with whether or not I do reveal that in um, in my work. Uh, what what uh, I think is interesting is to, to think about these things um, back at the dawn of the internet. And because I was there, I can tell you that there was this real celebration of all public information. And so you had this real push um, and uh, the suggestion that government should in fact put everything online. Uh, and then uh, for example, when I lived in Champaign, um, Urbana, Illinois, uh, we realized that um, all police tickets uh, were searchable and available online. Uh, and when you think about that sort of thing, when you think about you know, the possibility of health information, not so much, but, um, but that sort of information being used against people in terms of um, insurance, trying to get insurance, um, uh, suddenly I think it, it, it opens or it has opened court's eyes to the real um, potential damage out there from, from public records, um, including uh, these older older criminal records. I think it's just a matter of time before before courts routinely order this away. Um, again, um, uh, in order to facilitate that, some legislatures now have passed laws uh, that make it um, that that prevent police from releasing mugshots and and uh, especially mugshots of lower level crimes. So because of those sorts of websites that would just publish willy-nilly um, all mugshots, uh, now in Illinois, for example, um, uh, police cannot uh, uh, release um, misdemeanors and I think certain low-level felonies, but I could be wrong about that. So you see it on the access side as well, you know, concern from legislatures about, um, about uh, uh, release of information being too broad. Uh, I, I just want to want to flag two brief things about it. One is I think the mugshot is an excellent example because you know, the fact is <laughs> the, how somebody looks while they're arrested, not terribly useful. I mean, I think the, the circumstances of the arrest are pretty important. The mugshot, I think I can do without. And certainly there's nothing that says that the, uh, that the police 
need to release it. It's not a court record unless for whatever reason it's, in, it's admitted as evidence. So I think I'm fine with removing mugshots in many ways. Uh, although sometimes it is useful just for example, if you wanna figure out is this person that I've read about, is it really this, this person I know or somebody else? Um, on the other hand, people often raise insurance as an issue, but while I'm usually skeptical of restrictions on use, being that effective, because I agree that many an employer, especially a small employer, you know, it's very easy to just refuse it, uh, to hire an employee, no matter what the rules might be. I think those are very likely to work well with insurance companies. Insurance companies are large bureaucratic organizations that have to have very well-defined procedures for dealing with, with often millions of customers. And if you say to an insurance company, you may not consider any information that is drawn from a traffic ticket or you may not consider any information uh, drawn from a mental health hold or whatever. I'm not sure that's right. I mean, I think there could be good reason why we look, you know, uh, why we treat people differently based on various criteria. For example, uh, I'm getting older and presumably at some point that's going to be reflected in my life insurance policies. And I wouldn't want non-discrimination rules that say you can't discriminate based on age and selling life insurance. But I think insurance companies are the ones that are going to be among the most sensitive and most easily restrictable, practically speaking, by restrictions on use, because they've got to have procedures. They've got lots of employees. They know if they cheat and lots of people can blow the whistle. They don't have that much interest in cheating. They just adjust the rates uh, uh, appropriately. They just need to know the rules. Uh, so I wouldn't worry too much about the insurance question. Uh, but I do think there are all sorts of other reasons why we might not want to release certain information as well as reasons why we might want to. So uh, let me just uh, touch on that uh, worries about insurance information. I was I was surprised that uh, one of the data brokers uh, that I contacted does in fact share um, share information with health insurance companies. And uh, among one of my categories was um, fast food aficionado. So, uh, which is untrue, uh, and yet there it was in my um, in my data uh, collection set. So, uh, so I'm worried, uh, and and perhaps um, I shouldn't be uh, about that sort of information then uh, affecting um, my my health insurance uh, in the future. Not just age, uh, but the fact that you know they've tracked me somehow to um, to fast food restaurants. Although the 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 uh, so there are two possible ways of thinking about. It or three possible ways. One way of thinking about it is, it's just wrong for health insurance companies to discriminate based on factors that affect health, including voluntary factors. So I'm told that the insurance companies do distinguish based on whether you smoke or not, but maybe say you shouldn't. We should all have access to health insurance at the same rate, even if we do engage in certain things that foreseeably raise our risk. You, that may be kind of a non-discrimination So That's one possibility. A second possibility might be to say it's just wrong for insurance companies to have information like this, or at least if it's not drawn from us, because I do know there are questionnaires that ask me whether I smoke or not, but drawn from other, other places. That's an unfair intrusion on privacy. And a third possible thing is it's not about non-discrimination or privacy, it's just about accuracy. And that the real problem is they think that Amy likes fast food, but she's actually a very healthy eater. And that, and she might, but that actually might suggest that she would want to, or maybe she should want to have more such things so long as they're accurate. Because maybe people could accurately figure out, not just based on her say so, which of course insurance companies won't trust, but actually accurately figure out if she's a healthy eater, then she might get the healthy eater discount. So I think we need to just make sure that when we think about it, ask how much is privacy, how much is non-discrimination and how much is accuracy? Because you could imagine rules that say data brokers can release this information it's just they would be liable if they, if on um, kind of quasi defamation theories, as I understand certain kinds of background check laws already provide, if they gather the information incorrectly or either, either in the first instance or they fail to correct it later on. Well, and I think just to add maybe one final complication, not that we need more complication here, is, um, you know, there are some fascinating examples of where concealing certain information 
or requiring certain information to be concealed for these anti-discriminatory purposes, right, can backfire. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and so uh, Ignacio Cofoni has a wonderful paper where he talks about a couple of, uh, of these uh, instances where certain information was tried to be concealed, privacy was tried to use as a, as a tool to prevent discrimination, and it came to um, uh, very different outcomes, right? So one was the experiment that was done involving uh, people trying out to be part of an orchestra, um, and there was, you know, rampant gender discrimination in orchestras for a long time, maybe still to this day, I, I don't know. And so they did an experiment where people played their instruments behind a curtain. And the result was, at least as far as I can remember from reading this, that um, for the most part, the gender disparity melted away once the judges uh, couldn't see the gender of the person playing the musical instrument. So their kind of concealment or obscurity or privacy um, had this uh, salutary effect in terms of the discrimination. Um, but the opposite uh, happened with the ban the box laws, right? At least the empirical evidence, uh, uh, again, last time I checked on this, um, uh, tells not such a, a good tale, uh, which was that when employers were kind of prohibited from asking people in job applications whether they had a criminal history, uh, the idea being uh, that particularly black men who were disproportionately targeted by the criminal legal system uh, had criminal records that was then keeping them out of employment opportunities. Uh, rather than employers then no longer being able to do that and so maybe being, uh, you know, having less racial uh, discrimination in hiring practices, it had the opposite effect. Employers, it seemed, were more likely to discriminate on the basis of race because they could no longer check that there was a criminal history and make the determination on that. And so perhaps some employers were more likely to assume by, based on a job candidate's race that they had a criminal history. And so that kind of concealment can often have the opposite effect to how you want to do it. So, so it's, it certainly isn't just um, as easy, not that I, I took either Eugene or Amy to be suggesting that it was, but it's not always as easy as, well, we just need to stop certain information from being you know, part of the calculus because that can actually backfire in some circumstances. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Thomas, and sort of goes back to some of the, the other things that were said. So, you know, if we have courts for, say, a delisting order on Google, and traditionally, you know, maybe an employer was doing a cursory Google search, maybe if they're not able to do that, they go to a background check, which may be more invasive. Um, if we ban some set of information for being used for um, all sorts of determinations, maybe uh, these actors will move to sort of proxies for that information or find sort of other other systems for making determinations that we as a society may, may dislike. But I just wanna thank all three of you for raising all of these interesting complications. And I sort of think we've made sort of an, an initial foray into marking this distinction between the, the public right of access and the, the private right of uh, privacy and obscurity and how we can start to negotiate these boundaries as well as thinking about some of the larger sort of institutional and norm shifts that are currently at play within journalism um, and court reporting and other things. So um, I just want to say thank you on behalf of all of our participants and uh, UCLA's Institute for Technology, Law and Policy. Uh, thank you so much for joining us all today. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much.